floss tube. It's Arlene here. It's Friday, October 9th, and I'm back to share a bunch of things with you. I have quite the variety in front of me. Uh, October 9th, like where's time going here? I mean, some days it feels so slow, and then you look at the calendar and you're like, no, we're almost a third of the way through October. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I am not liking these days getting shorter or the sunlight not being out as long or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I am very aware we are about three weeks away from the savings time and the time change. And I am just someone that does not do well with that. Like it takes me time to kind of really adjust. And I'm not just talking about sleep. I'm just talking about the, the early darkness. So I'm not looking forward to that, and I'm not liking that even now I've had to switch my after-dinner walks to before-dinner walks. That's just the way it is. So let me jump in. Uh, like I said, it's quite a variety of stuff I have, but the first thing slash things is to share with you some new patterns that I'm releasing to you all today. Uh, they are available now on my Etsy store. And a box just went out to Hoffman, um, which is to say uh, LNSs can order through Hoffman or order through me directly. And so the first thing to share with you is a duo. Uh, am I getting this right? There we go. So I know this might be a little bit too early for Hanukkah, but we're doing Hanukkah, folks. I am aware that there's lots of holiday designs out there, and I'm also aware that maybe they're not out yet. Maybe like November 1st is a, it seemed like September 1st was a time when a lot of designers came out with fall slash October things. So I'm guessing November 1st, because I, I, I just haven't been in tune to it in the last couple of years. But so here, if that is the case, I am a couple weeks early. Um, I am very aware there are not many Hanukkah designs out there. And you don't have to be turning them into ornaments. I have made some little pillows here. You can have a, a dough bowl display. Uh, some people do have something like a Hanukkah tree and they do want a ornament like that they could stitch. So I, like I did last year, <laughs> have both menorah design and a Jewish star design. And the reason why I'm holding up two menorahs here is because I started to design a black work version. I just thought it would be something different, something, a small black work piece that people could try. Um, and so in order to do this, I was first charting in my design software, basically blocks, i.e. like cross stitch blocks. And then I was going to convert it using um, straight lines. And when I had the cross stitch version in the computer, I started looking at it and thinking, well, one of the things I love to do is vary the number of strands one strand, two strand, even three strands. And I thought, well, let me try a cross stitch version where there's a little bit of variety going on. So the blue outline is two strands. The blue inside is one strand. The outline of the yellow here is two strands. And can you see it? What I decided to do was tent stitches, half a cross stitch using one strand in there. Um, and I love the way I look. I also love black work. And I love the way this came out. Both of them uh, have Mill Hill beads for the candles, for the candle flames. Uh, this one, this one was stitched on 32 count. This one was stitched on 28 count just to help the, the difference between one stitch and two stitch show up a little bit more clearly. Um, I have finished them both using a, just a ribbon going around in a ruffled sort of way. I based this off Oh, and I meant to bring it over here. It's okay. Um, I based this off a, a sweet gift from, from Kim, who's one of my stitching group. Uh, she's also Barbara's daughter here on Floss Tube. She had given me a little pillow for my birthday, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to finish these, and I was like, oh, I'll just use that. Now, I believe that might have come from a Vano tutorial. Uh, I should have checked this ahead of time. That may not be correct, but anyway, it's ribbon sort of pleated around. Um, and so these, both of these come in the same pattern. Menorah Dura. You get the black work design, you get the cross stitch design, you get both of them. 
And maybe it's something you want to give a little try to for black work. Maybe you want to do both of them. I stitch both of them using gentle arts threads. Uh, blueberry was the blue and gold leaf was the yellow. You can use any threads you want. Um, I do think the variegation that comes out, I think you see it pretty clearly in there, just adds a little extra touch. So that's my first of the patterns I have for you today. And the second one is my other, my other Hanukkah design. It is a star. Now, I liked the idea. It's something I play with in geometry a lot, the idea of weaving lines. And when do you have one continuous path, which is often referred to as a knot, like K-N-O-T, uh, and when you don't have a continuous path. And at first glance, you might not know what's going on here, but uh, it's not a continuous path. It's um, uh, like, I'm hoping you see it. Oops, yeah. And yeah, it ends there and goes around and underneath and over and comes around and it ends there. <laughs> it's hard. Anyway, I love the look of it. It certainly could be something you stitch for Hanukkah. It certainly could be something you stitch at any other time of the year that a Jewish star would be fun and appropriate to use. I stitch it using DMC Etoile. And I think you could see some of the sparkle there. Uh, if you have not used a 12 thread, it's worth giving a try to. My comment, suggestion about, there was one project I did where I used one strand because of the size of the fabric, because it was what was appropriate for that. And it, you just didn't get the sparkle from it. There was almost like, what's the point of doing this? But I gave it a second try, and the second try was using two strands. That made all the difference. So I used three different colors of etoile here uh, and stitched this on 32 count. You don't have to use that count or that thread. Uh, so use the same sort of technique for the ribbon. Although I'll say this ribbon was not, it was like too stiff. It wasn't, it wasn't good ribbon to use. But by the time I had decided that, I was already halfway through the sewing and I'm like, hey, I'm leaving it. So Hanukkah Star is my next design to share with you. And... Um, All right, moving away from Hanukkah world, uh, the next one has a has a good story behind it. And I know a number of people have commented very kindly that they enjoy when I share stories. Oh, sorry, if you are new here, <laughs> um, I design under Works by ABC. My initials are ABC, and that's where I came up with the name. Um, you can find my designs on my Etsy store, and LNSs can order through Hoffman. And today is a video where I'm showing you new releases. So the next one slash ones uh, have a good story. And I like to share stories. I often write some background information on the patterns that I'm sharing. And to show you or to help you get the background, I want to show you this. And that is a wall hanging called an arid. A-R-I-D, and I think I'm pronouncing it right. I'm pronouncing it the same way you would talk about like a, a desert being arid, um, dry. But it's a Moroccan hanging, and it, it's from the Metropolitan Museum of Art's website. I find that um, has so is a wealth of amazing pictures and, and pieces and everything, and so sometimes I'm just scrolling through, you know, I pick a word like geometry or a, a, something and I start scrolling through the pictures. When I hit this one, I was so taken by the geometry of it. And I will zoom in particularly on the end part right there. And I don't know how else to describe it other than I wanted a little challenge. I wanted to see if I could do that in cross stitch or if I could chart it in cross stitch, you know, in effect pixelizing um, is what you're doing when you're translating something into a cross stitch pattern or like a pre-made thing like this. Um, and so starting with the most inner, well, <laughs> starting with the most inner part, uh, where'd it go? Sorry. Starting there <laughs> with, I can't make it any bigger than this, like really in the center. And making that as small as I could. And then building out from there, trying to make the triangles and the curves all work. I did it. 
and you can see maybe you could see I think I I think I got it pretty close so I was really pleased with myself for doing this but as I was going along I was aware of what size it was becoming yeah this right here is 471 by 471 stitches mm-hmm I really wondered how many people would be interested in stitching something so large. Now, I would say if you stitch this on red fabric, you could cut out a whole bunch of stitches and make it so it's not a full coverage piece. But still, that's an awfully big piece. And I thought, hmm, what if I just did the center area there? And I did. And I think this one is, is a beautiful piece on its own. If you want to go, so you can see what I call this, I'm calling arid. This one I'm calling supersized or arid supersized because that's what it is. Um, on the back of these, I give some background information, what, what um, I know from the Mets website. And it is a piece that is, as of right now, is on display on, yeah, with, you know, it's, if you go to the museum, you could see it. And, you know, I wish New York City wasn't such a, to do to get there otherwise I'd be going to the museums there a whole lot more often than I actually do anyway so I thought these this idea might appeal to some other folks I very much enjoy the challenge of doing this I'm pleased with the results but I'm also acknowledging that maybe these results are a little too big and maybe there will be some folks interested in that geometric design the next is also geometry based and it circles back to the to the Hanukkah star. When I started playing around with the Hanukkah star and you know thinking of six points, but overlapping the the pathways is what I call them, I started to go more into well what happens beyond six points? What if I tried for something more? I was going for eight. I, points didn't work. This is what I came up with. So it's eight um, curves, <laughs> eight places. It also, like the Hanukkah star, is not a straight path. There are actually four different, almost like figure eight looking paths. And I chose to chart this using four different shades of the same color, a certain blue that had four shades that worked well. You don't have to, you could do it however you want. Um, I'm calling it interwoven because that's what's happening. All the, the pathways are interwoven. I actually debated what's the difference between interwoven and intertwined? And I was doing a whole bunch of Googling and the vast majority basically say there isn't really that much of a difference. They are mostly interchangeable, although some people will get a little bit more specific. And anyway, I went with interwoven. So um, I love this. I love that it. I didn't just... At first, I had left it as is um, with the paths. I thought, hmm, a little too plain. So including some floral motifs on the inside just made it for me. And the last one to share with you uh, is another one if, um, no, I was going to say it's from the Met, but it's I'm pretty sure it's not from the Met's website. Don't quote me on that. I know where I got it was not the Mets website. It was somewhere else. But sometimes these show up in more than one place. Um, from a book that was published in 1666. And if you've been with me at, for any length of time, you know that I look for inf inspiration from old books. And when I say old, I'm talking centuries old pattern books. So I saw this, which I had not seen before. And I just thought it had so much potential. And I, in a flurry of hours and hours in a, in a condensed setting time, I was able to chart it, turn it into something a little bit more for the 21st century. And I think that that's what so appeals to me is that things that are literally almost 500 years old can be reborn using some slight modifications, some color. So I'm calling it Floral Delight. Uh, I just, I love the colors of this. I'm so pleased with the way it turned out um, and the inspiration where it came from. So there you go. Those are my new releases for today. The, the two Hanukkah ones, 
the, the two arid versions, the interwoven and the floral delight. And you can find links to all of them down below it to my Etsy store. Uh, if you weren't already aware, I sell my patterns both as paper copies and PDFs. So there's a separate listing for each. You can't, you can't do both in one listing for Etsy. So if you are a PDF person, you can, um, categories, is that what it's called? I have a category of PDF. I have a category of paper. So you could like just be looking at one each if you go to whatever you like. Um, and make sure that you're, if you're purchasing something, that you're purchasing the version that you like, PDF or paper. Um, I have found, you know, I haven't done the statistics in a while, but the last time I looked, it, it was about 50-50. Maybe PDF was um, slightly in the lead, but I don't know where they are right now. So in my last video, when I said that there was going to be new patterns in the next video, this one, I said, as I like to do, is a, a giveaway. So, and I, if you've been with me before, you have seen me take this bowl. Um, I know how to use an automatic number generator. <laughs> to me, there is something so elemental, ele elementary, no, whatever I'm trying to think of, about doing it with paper and with hand pulling out paper. Um, we all stitchers, we work with our hands so much and, and, love technology. I'm not, I mean, I could only do things that I do if it wasn't for technology, but sometimes it's nice to bring that old fashioned way back in. So for everyone that entered my giveaway, I have your paper, your name on a piece of paper here. Um, I am going to pick two people. You can choose any pattern you want. It doesn't have to be the new releases and it could be PDF or I'll send you a paper copy, whatever you would like. So the first winner for today is Philippa Dublin. Yeah, there we go. Philippa, du Philippa underscore Dublin. Now that I'm, all right. I hope I remember this later on, but I just thought about something now. Okay. And then the second winner for today is Renee Crump spelled like that, Renee Crump. So thank you to everyone who entered. Um, if you are Renee or Philippa, um, feel free to be in touch, worksbyabc at gmail.com. Um, I will also try to remember to go back to my last video and comment on your comments. Um, I've not always remembered to do that, but sometimes the people who have won have seen it before I remember to do it. Anyway, congratulations. Um, and I hope everyone will, will give a try to seeing what my work is about. If, if you haven't seen my work, please give it a look. Um, and if you have, I just want to say thank you to those who have supported me in these um, three years now that I've been doing works by ABC. Um, for those who tag me on Instagram or mention, mention me in a floss tube video, it is all really appreciated. Okay, next thing on my list was just to share a little something and <laughs> If I'm the last person to know about this, please forgive me, but I didn't know about this before. I have in the last weeks, it has seemed like, been doing a lot of cleaning out, reorganizing of things. Like you can't see it from what you view here, but there's been a lot of cleaning out and reorganizing um, up here in my loft. And it, you know, it feels good when you do that. Like even going through the, the containers I just labeled thread, which is everything besides DMC, and I had three of those, and just trying to organize them, let alone other things. I've learned to do it a little bit at a time. If I were to try and do this this whole project, you know, in one weekend, I tap out. I I get too frustrated with myself. But one little step at a time. So one of the steps was a couple of days I spent the table that you all are sitting on right now. And one thing that I had noticed and I'd been aware of is the number of scissors I've collected. I, I've never thought of myself as a scissor collector. Um, and just wanting a better way to keep them other than the way I had been keeping them. I know many people talk about scissor, fro scissor frogs. And it seems like the only ones I've heard or seen of on floss, floss tube are ones that people have found like in a thrift store or something. And I thought, well, they have to exist somehow. Go to Google, go to Amazon. Scissor frog was leading me to flower frog. 
And I feel like I've heard that somewhere, that many of, not the ones that have the holes around the edge so much, um, but anyway, what I found was these. It's meant to go on a jar, like the, the, the ball jars that you buy. It came with two pieces, and then you have the holes to put things in. So yes, sure, certainly works for flowers, but I also have it working for scissors. Now, I realized too late, once I came home, that I probably should have gotten the tall jars because I wasn't aware that my, I just wasn't consciously aware that my uh, scissor fobs were very long. So um, I, at some point, it's not a high priority by any means, but at some point when I am, you know, in Michael's or wherever, and around these jars, I will probably get the bigger ones. Now, a heads up, if you um, are interested in this, because again, I didn't know they existed. I'll put a link down below to where I, to the, the listing on Amazon. Just be aware that there's different sizes. Like this is what I was thinking of as a standard size, but I almost mistakenly bought a different listing, not realizing that there is another mm, standard size that's much wider. So just be aware, you know, what size jar, what size opening and so on. Um, just to share, because I, um, all the scissors that are in here, I had not, I'm trying to think when I consciously decided this. Each of these represent a stitching retreat slash adventure that I've been on. The spirit of this comes from my bobbin lace world, and we're gonna be talking about lace in the later part of this video. In bobbin lace world, it is very common to, to make, create, buy a bobbin, a collector bobbin that represents the event that you are at. Um, maybe someday I'll show you my collection of those. I, I tend to not use them for my lace, I just have a collection of them. And so what happened with my scissors, it, it started with scissor fobs. The very first New Jersey retreat that I put on in May of 2018, um, not known ahead of time, Barbara, who is now Part of my stitching group and a dear dear person so glad I know her um, showed up saying huh I made scissor fobs for everybody and we handed them all out and it was wonderful and as it was I ended up there, there were a few extra I ended up with keeping them and I put one on a pair of scissors that's the only one that's not here it's down um, where I stitch and then five weeks, six weeks afterwards, I was headed to StitchCon in 2018. And so I put one of those others on this pair of scissors. This was the fob that Barbara made. And when I was at StitchCon, we had a little make and take um, project and it was a StitchCon fob. And so I kept both of these on here because it's just how, you know, I put it on here to make sure it didn't get lost in my luggage. And from there, the idea was born. Why not think about doing the what I do for bobbins for stitching events. And I was thinking more about scissor fobs, but it has evolved to be a little bit more of um, the scissors and the fob when appropriate. So for example, I'm trying to think the order of how things happened. After that came the um, stitch nanigans in Arizona. These um, crystals McKenna uh, gave out as part of the goodies. Um, and these is a, this is a pair of scissors I bought at the attic. Then came StitchCon of 2019. And so again, it has two fobs in it. This was again the, the make and take for that year. This was a fob that I picked off, off the freebie table. I mean, they were all free. Someone had made a bunch of them and had just offered them and I just picked one, it was beautiful. So this is my StitchCon 2019 scissor. Uh, then came the New Jersey retreat um, of 2019 in August. We made, is it backwards for you? There we go. New Jersey retreat 2019 scissor fobs for everyone. This was a pair of scissors that I had gotten. I, there was originally going to be a different a, a plan that involved fancy scissors that never happened. But this was one of the, um, this was the, I ordered one to see what, what I was going to do with it. Anyway, so it became appropriate for me to consider this as my New Jersey Retreat 2019 scissors. Then in October of 2019, I went down to um, Virginia, 
right outside of Washington, D.C. for Stitch Fest. Uh, and that was just a great couple days, much smaller than the other retreats I was at. And it gave the wonderful opportunity for me to see Ingeborg again, a Stitch Too Far here on Floss 2. She brought for everybody Dutch shoes, Holland. Oh, wait, now I'm going to get this wrong. Oh, she explained the, the, the idea of Netherlands, Holland, Dutch. Ingeborg, if you're watching, forgive me. I should have remembered the lesson you told us. She brought these keychains for everybody. And then I went to the needlework store. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking on it. It's in Northern Virginia. It's right down the road from Woodlawn. Um, and I'm blanking on the name. I know it's got the word stitch in it somehow. And I bought this pair of scissors there specifically, again, to be a pair of scissors that was part of my um, souvenir from that event. And then the last scissors that I have in here, and oh, forgive me that I haven't really finished this off, is when I went to market in um, March. And I there was a, a booth, a room, where among everything else, there were just a whole bunch of little trinkets. And he told the story of he had bought some display shelves and it had all these trinkets and the person just threw in all the trinkets. So he had a bowl and kind of looked through and pick out what you want. I think they were a dollar each. Nashville is known for its music. And even though we were nowhere near the music scene, this seemed an appropriate thing. This was a pair of scissors I bought from one of the people there. Yeah, I admit it's just a piece of thread that's holding it on. I definitely meant to get at least nicer thread. And I just, you know, when I was doing this, I realized I had never even replaced this. The other jar is just the scissors that have come. Some of them have been sweet gifts. They have just arrived in my hands in one way or the other. So this jar is my souvenir scissors. These are my other very nice glad to own them scissors. And so now they can sit here on the side of my table <clears throat> in a much more organized fashion. And so if you didn't know about this idea before, now you know. And if everyone watching me already knew this, then, oh well, I now know it myself. <laughs> okay, next thing to share is I, um, the project not the one, so my current stitching is is once again going to be some secret stitching. That's just the way it's often been for me. But the project I'm planning after my current stitching, uh, I was on the lookout for some fabric and went to Needleworkers, which is my LNS, and poked around a little bit online. I just couldn't find what I was looking for. I didn't have a specific color in mind as much as I wanted like a bold color. Excuse me. So it occurred to me, one night as I was trying to fall asleep. You know, people dye their own fabric. I had never done it before. I admit I was a little scared of it. So if you're like me, or like I was, and you're like, oh, I never want to do that dying thing. It, eh. Okay, I'm here to tell you, all you got to do is follow the directions on the bottle. <laughs> um, I invested $3, exactly $3 at the dollar store. I bought a pair of rubber gloves, the largest bowl, plastic bowl that I could get, and a pair of tongs, you know, to put in. And I had some writ dye from the time that I was going to be brave, like literally about two years ago, and then never did. And for that, it was about dyeing thread, not even fabric, um, because I had seen someone, either a floss tube or maybe on Instagram, who had made this beautiful thread, or had this beautiful thread, and when I asked what thread it was, the response was, oh, I dyed it myself. Anyway, that was an idea a couple years ago that I never did. So I had some thread. I had some fabric. Um, because I've been cleaning out, I kind of acknowledged what fabric I did have and what, what's the good stuff and what is not the good stuff. This is not the good stuff. Um, I just had this, you know, wasn't... Anyway, and I knew that this is not going to be a big enough piece for the eventual project I'm thinking about. And that's okay. It makes it all the better to practice on. So this is the color that it ended up with, and it's, it's coming out pretty close on camera. What's interesting is it comes from this color, hyacinth. And I think you can tell that that's two different colors there. So first lesson is don't go by the color on the bottle, um, at least not hyacinth, I can't speak for others, other colors. I love 
the way this turned out. I mean, if this had been a different, a bigger size, it, it might be something I would have gone ahead and used. What I loved, and this might have been a factor that I didn't, I mean, I left it in for 15, 20 minutes, and they said you could leave it in for up to 30 minutes or something. There are still bits of the white linen coming through, just the tiniest bits that give it a really nice, look or at least it's the look that I like uh yes I never zigzagged or surged or anything in my edges yes I'm a heathen like that I just threw it in as is and so I followed the directions on the bottle okay and then since this was all going to be a big test anyway the last step says um to wash in warm water like after you've done the other things it involves salt water dye time <laughs> um and then you rinse it out using cold water to get the dye out. But then the last step is to wash it in warm, warm water. And I thought, what the hell? I threw it in the washing machine. I figured that's going to be my ultimate test. Uh, and the dye didn't leave the fabric. It, pretty, it looked pretty much the same as it was when it went in. It did not turn my washing machine any color. So I'm feeling really good about using that as, a, as an ending step. Now, I also, in the cleaning out, knew that I had this fabric that... Um, is garbage. I will be throwing it away. I only saved it to show you all here. Uh, it was um, like a beige, like not a crew, like darker than that, like a beige color. And the time that I tried, the reason I bought it, it's it, the project I start on it, it is awful to stitch on. And it basically boils down to there's like almost no hole between the threads. Anyway, this, I will, I will not be stitching on this fabric. I, I won't even send it to anybody because it's such horrible fabric. But it was a good lesson to see the difference between what happens when you start on white and what happens when you start on beige. I mean, this color doesn't appeal to me, especially when I have this color next to it. So um, I just wanted to share that with you. And then while I was at it, remember how I said the reason I had dye was because I had this grand plan a couple of years ago to dye thread. Well, in the bag with the dye was about five or six skeins of uh, white DMC. I pulled them out, threw them in the water as well. And I purposely left, I'm trying to see, yeah, that's pretty cool. I think you could see here. I clearly left this one in longer than this one, um, just to prove to myself you can get different shades. And I love the way these came out. I will need to find a project um, that I can stitch. It, it's not going to work for, I'm not trying to do a monochrome kind of thing. But um, I will keep in mind the idea of using these for some point in the future. So there it is, my first dyeing adventure. And my advice, again, if you are someone who is like me thinking a little too scary, just do it. <laughs> it was, I, you know, I, I didn't make too much of a mess. I, I did it in the sink, um, you know, contained my splashing and stuff like that. And all was fine. Give it a try. All right. My next topic uh, is something that happened just Last weekend, although it kind of continues onward, I have shared in the past about Winterthur, which is a place in Delaware uh, that was a, a DuPont, whatever his name is, is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, house, mansion, museum, gardens. It, it's a beautiful place. So many acres and acres. It's a beautiful place to visit. If I lived closer, I would be there all the time. I'd be going to every event they offered and everything. Like so many other places, it closed um, and it reopened at some point during the summer under very limited basis. It's opened even more now. You do need to reserve ahead of time and, and there's limiting capacity. But one thing that was planned and had been planned for a long time was a needlework conference. Uh, they have been doing this every two, sometimes every three years for longer than I'm aware of. Uh, and it's a wonderful event. I've talked about this before in my floss tube videos, having gone twice, I'm pretty sure it was only twice before, two days, Friday and Saturday. The first time I went, you know, even though I'd re read the description, I was just so amazed because what I realized is that it was like an academic um, conference. Their people were presenting their like lectures on either a study or research or something. The afternoon, so the mornings were lectures, the afternoons were a little bit more of mm, hands-on kind of sessions. There were some stitching sessions. You could purchase a kit 
Um, and I know some, it seemed like some people go just for those opportunities, but I never did any of those. I, I know I took a special tour in the special collections of the library. There was last time we took, um, a field trip. If you were lucky enough to get one of the spots to, um, the West, what, West, Westings, Westing school. It, it has the word West and I'm blanking, but it's in Pennsylvania, which is right nearby where Winterthur is. And it is a place that's still a school, Quaker, um, but it has history going back like 200 years. And at that time, it was very well known for the Quaker schoolgirl school girl samplers. And so we went there and got to see from their archives and just learn a little bit about, more about that experience. Anyway, there was supposed to be one of these conferences this fall. What did they do? They turned it into a virtual event. And I thought, not bad. You know, I was I was thinking I, I was going to go this year. But this way, I didn't have to spend the money for hotel and gas and food. And I could sit here and watch slash listen to the lectures and stitch at the same time. Like, it doesn't get any better than that. Another piece that I realized as as information came on, what they did is there were eight lectures, what would have been four on one day, four on the other day, that were pre-recorded. And that meant you could take your time in watching them. They're available, I think, through the end of the month, which has just been wonderful. Because one thing I know I felt both times I went was overload of information or, yeah, oh, information overload that just too many ideas and too many things. And sure, a couple lectures here and there that I wasn't that interested in. And this way, I got to do it all on my own. Then what they had live during the Friday and Saturday of last week were some conversations between the um, the various presenters, as well as a special, um, a couple of other sessions. One thing, so it was a great, I was so glad that I had this opportunity. Um, I'm you know, didn't mind at all spending the money for this because it was well worth it. One piece to share with you, and I knew about this, and I want to say it goes back to the last time I was at the conference, which is 2016, four years ago. At that time, Winterthur had just received and was just beginning to work with um, the, the needlework from the estate of Erica Wilson. Now, at that time, I vaguely might have known that name sounds familiar, and I think she did some stitching that's about all. I learned a lot at that time, and I've learned even more this time. The woman who was the graduate student who was just beginning to work with the collection four years ago has now finished the collection. There's a book coming out, or not finished, finished cataloging. Um, and Winterthur owns many of the pieces that Erica Wilson created. Now, if you're like me and you didn't know who Erica Wilson was, you need to kind of thank her for a lot of the stitching world that exists today. She was the first one that ever did correspondence courses. She was the one who brought needlework a different face than what it had been in the decades before. She was born in England, went to the Royal School of Needlework in the late 40s, came to the U.S. in the early 50s, um, and was off and running. She had a store. She had two stores, one in Nantucket, one in New York City. She was on a television show. She was she created a television show that was filmed right next to Julia Child. So she was the, the needlework version of Julia Child. And you could still watch those episodes somewhere online because I know I've seen them. Anyway, that was one of the sessions, was learning a little bit more about her, about the donation to Winterthur, what is in their collections now. And just one little piece I wanted to share with you. So up... No, actually, it's on the shelf above. You can't see it. I actually had a few Erica Wilson books. And the reason I had them is the year she passed away, I'd have to go back and check, 2014 or something. It was probably in the wintertime. I was aware that there were enough, it was enough that was made in like the bigger needlework world, made of it, that that year when I was working at my the big book sale that I volunteer at each year and I unpack books, there were Erica Wilson books. And I want to say there's always Erica Wilson books. Her main heydays were in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They are very dated looking books. I never gave them a passing thought. But there was something about that year and I thought maybe I should pick up a few of these. I used book sales, one, two dollars. Um, I guess I thought maybe they would become valuable. And that's not the case. There's so many of them out there. But now I'm glad I had them. I just want to share with you. So this is 
the embroidery book. I mean, even from that, that just screams seventies to me, the colors and everything. But this was an interesting story and I thought you would be interested in hearing about it. This piece is one of the pieces, this Elizabethan woman is one of the pieces Erica Wilson did when she was a student at the Royal School of Needlework for her white work piece of degree. And she ended up using this idea for the beginning of each chapter of this embroidery book. So while she had the version she had created in at the Royal School of Needlework, she created five others. So if I can get my little bookmark pieces, here is the version of the Elizabethan lady done in cruel. I know these are black and white. I wish they were in color. Here is the Elizabethan lady done in needlepoint. Here is the Elizabethan lady done in silk and gold threads. And man, I wish I could see, and I, I got this correct. Uh, Winterthur now has five out of the six of them, and one of them has just been lost to time. I think I'm saying that right. And it's this one. And the problem is when you put little pieces of paper, there we go, they don't let you turn. And man, would this be nice to see in color. Um, then the white work version. Oh, nope, nope. Then comes the black work version. I already showed you the white work version. And then the last one in here is a stunk work version. And I just, it, I hope, for those who know me, you've been watching my videos, I hope you could see why it appeals to me, you know, to take one image and reproduce it in different ways. That's, I've done versions of that, not as nice as these, obviously. I'll share with you that there is now a wonderful website. It's, you know, it's a part of a winter, it's ericawilson.winterter.org. I don't know, I'll put a link below. If I've intrigued you at all to learn a little bit about Erica Wilson, um, again, a lot of the popularity of needlework, which obviously comes and goes over the decades, but so much of that is thanks to this woman, and I think more stitchers should know about her. The last thing on my list to talk to you about today is going into my lace world. So if you are not so interested in lace, fine. Hope you enjoyed what I've shared so far. But for those of you who are interested, I um, my main lace interest is bobbin lace. Uh, and I've shown that in other videos, and it's about time I show it again. Um, but I, a few weeks back, uh, encountered a video, and I just got a little obsessed with it. And it's a kind of, it's a lace called Limerick Lace from Ireland. Limerick, Ireland. Uh, it is not a bobbin lace. It is not a needle lace. Those are the two big categories of acknowledged lace. There are some other things, like knitted lace, crocheted lace, which are the same but different. But then there's other categories which are um, uh, done on, like it's more of an embroidered lace. And that's where I'm going with this. Limerick lace is done on a net, like machine created net, but a cotton net, not like the nylon stuff you could buy at Joann's. Uh, and you, in effect, embroider on it. Here's my little practice piece of Limerick Lace. Now, it doesn't look like much, and I haven't even finished this one. And up close, you can see that like, they get better as I went along. Uh, I once had someone, I was in a bobbin lace like retreat slash class, and there was a couple beginners, and then the most of us, most of us had already been there, already been doing lace and were just sort of working retreat life fashion. And I, one of the beginners was struggling with something and just, it was a natural thing for me. I, I happened to have with me my binder of lace going back to my very first pieces. And I opened it up to show her, oh, look, I, I once did it, you know, like this and look, look at this mistake I made here. And, you know, and she said to me afterward, thank you so much for doing that to see your beginnings, to see your mistakes, to, to share, you know, obviously I had progressed so much in my lace world. It's hard to look back at those pieces, but that's the beginning. And I think that's a valuable lesson in its own. When you have the opportunity to help somebody, sometimes it means sharing 
what it was like for you when you started that thing that the person now needs help for. And this is obviously bigger than need a work world. Anyway, I saw this video, which I will link below. Um, I was just so intrigued. I had never, no, I take that, I once other time have explored a type of needle, a type of lace that, again, not bob and not needle, so a type of lace that is done on a machine net like this. I acquired or borrowed some books, the um, International Organization of Lace Inc., IOLI, here in the US, uh, has a lending library. And you could, you know, pay five bucks for shipping and they'll send you any book that you want and you keep them for a few weeks and you send them back. So, of course, I went and, you know, got their Limerick Lace books. Um, now, I found this is interesting that this, they chose to use black on the cover. I mean, it's it's a beautiful piece, but it's unusual that it's black thread. Most of the Limerick Lace pieces like here on this cover, uh, you could see... Why, you can see I'm very much at a beginner level of this uh, compared to um, things that look like this. There are some beautiful pieces of lace that, I mean, I would love if I were up close to some of these to be able to really see, um, you know, what, what I learned from that video, what I've learned from reading these books, um, to see it up close in person. I'll, I mean, I'll share with you the beginning. The video taught me that there's two types of, um, background isn't the right word, two types of stitches that are used to fill in a lot of the spaces, and then there's a whole bunch of specialty stitches. That video really only focuses on those two. It's called the heavy darn, heavy darn, and light darn. And my first attempt at the heavy darn, I'm trying to hold this so you could see it, um, is pretty messy. But my second attempt at it, got a little better. I think my third attempt was even better. My first attempt at the light darn, I'm going to declare, was an absolute failure because I just didn't understand what was going on. Once I got some books in hand, I made, I did better with it. And um, I need more practice in all of those. I, I, you know, for me, it's, it's exploring something new. It's using a needle, not bobbin. So that alone, it's always a comfort to have a needle going. I don't know how much I'll be exploring Limerick Lace, but it was a, a fun new thing to try. Um, and we'll see how many projects I may or may not make out of it. And what will I do with them? I don't know. That's not necessarily my focus, particularly with my lace pieces. Um, so there you go. That is all that is on my list. I know that this is um, stitching light, it meaning that I'm not showing a whole lot of stitching during my floss tube, this one and many of my previous ones. And I know many floss tubes are, you know, one project after another or one finish after another or one new patterns after another. Um, and clearly there's lots of people who enjoy that. So if you are here, I'm hoping you're enjoying what I'm sharing as a part of my floss tube, which goes, you know, beyond cross stitch. And that's just who I am. So as before, thank you so much. Thank you for the, for the support of my designing. Uh, thank you for just being here and being a part of my world for a little bit. Till next time. Bye.